You're listening to the Hayek Program Podcast. This podcast includes audio from lectures, interviews, and discussions from scholars and visitors of the F.A. Hayek Program for Advanced Study in Philosophy, Politics, and Economics at the Mercatus Center at George Mason University. To learn more about the Hayek Program, visit hayek.mercatus.org. To learn about graduate student fellowship opportunities with the Mercatus Center at George Mason University for students at Mason as well as at universities across the globe, please visit students.mercatus.org. Uh, my name is Peter Betke. I am a university professor of economics and philosophy at George Mason University and the director of the F.A. Hayek program in philosophy, politics, and economics. And I'm here today with Professor Richard Eveling, who is a BB&D professor of ethics and free enterprise leadership at the Citadel in South Carolina. Uh, Professor Eveling, we've been having some interesting conversations uh, about the history of the Austrian school and um, the development of uh, the sort of classical liberal movement um, in general. Uh, you have a new book out right now called For a New Liberalism. Um, can you tell our listeners a little bit about it? Yes, the book came out a little over two months ago. Uh, and the theme of it uh, for a new liberalism is uh, we can think of uh, the, the title in one of two ways. Uh, that uh, liberalism uh, has uh, been attacked and, uh, and, uh, and been co-opted and needs to be replaced by a different liberalism. Or we could say that uh, liberalism has been uh, attacked and rejected and has to be reconstructed completely. And in a sense, I feel a little bit of both. Uh, I think that liberalism as traditionally understood, in, let's say in the 19th century, classical liberalism, has been co-opted by a, a, a neoliberalism that in fact is very far from its original roots. And at the same time, uh, there are those who reject any form of liberalism and wish to uh, establish a more, uh, in the broadest sense, uh, uh, a collectivist uh, social and political and economic order. So the book is meant to be a response to both and make a case for a return to a refined, improved, and extended uh, liberalism based upon uh, the respect and dignity of the individual in the context of a free market and the voluntary institutions of civil society. Um, one of the, the difficult questions, of course, is the context of our times, uh, and Hayek has in the, the Constitution of Liberty, he says that the old uh, ideas must be restated uh, with each generation because no matter how true they are, they lose, their, they don't resonate with the current generation. Um, but there is also a lot to be learned from the past about where the difficulties were. And I was wondering if you see uh, parallels, perhaps even ominous ones, between the 1930s and today's intellectual world and practical world, the policy world as well. Yes, I think there are ways. And obviously, we're not facing a, a threats of such a, a direct and a governmentally d directed attack as we saw in the Years, decades between the uh, the two world wars. For instance, there is no Soviet Russia with a political government directed agenda of a world revolution. Yeah. Uh, we are not facing uh, a Benito Mussolini who uh, organizes his government uh, on the basis of a formal rejection of liberalism and the coining and an attempt to implement what he he said was totalitarianism. Uh, nothing uh, against the state. Nothing. Uh, above the state, everything within the state, uh, nor are we challenged in the same way by another form of rejection of liberalism, and that's uh, national socialist racism uh, and, and an aggressive nation attempting to, for wide uh, military and political conquest. But it doesn't change the fact that we are under a sense of a counter-revolution against liberty. And this is represented by a whole variety of forces, uh, to use the usual terminology, on the left and the right. And this is the rise of, on the one hand, uh, under the guise of, quote, democratic socialism, unquote, uh, a rejection of the market economy and a belief that the state must either heavily handedly regulate the economy or even an out and out call for older fashioned nationalization uh, uh, of industry and direct planning of the economy. And on the other side, uh, a populist nationalism that focuses itself on a narrower cultural and, and sometimes even ethnic identity and rejects uh, the, what the classical liberal would have considered the best of the themes of 
internationalism and, and globalization, cosmopolitanism, mm -hmm. uh, what, what the free trade movement of the 19th century under Cobden and Bright referred to as uh, free trade, uh, goodwill among nations, and peace. Uh, those are the finest elements of a true uh, globalization or, or cosmopolitanism. And, and that, those are both, uh, all of that is under attack by both the nationalists and the reborn socialists. Uh, and we see this whittled away in the society as a whole. As that people have lost their, 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 their anchor and understanding of uh, the ideals upon which this country was founded. Uh, I know that there's a lot of dispute, argument, and, uh, and venomous attack against the founding fathers because of their own inherent contradictions and inconsistencies. Um, all men are less than perfect. But what this stood out was the ideals upon which they founded this country. The idea that the individual inherently has certain rights that neither majorities nor minorities can abolish or restrain. Uh, that the role of the government is to secure those liberties precisely so men may pursue their own self-guided purposes and roles in society in peaceful association with others. Uh, people seem to not appreciate that. They don't understand the role or importance or the dangers of that government can give to the very essence and, <coughs> and everyday aspects of, of personal freedom. <coughs> I wanted to ask you a, a personal question uh, that just dawned on me because um, it has to do with Lionel Robbins, uh -huh. who you had the good fortune to meet with. Yes. Um, and the reason why I bring this up is because um, uh, over the last decade, um, I've had the opportunity to try to revisit and think about, f for a variety of reasons, um, the contributions that Robbins made during the 1930s. Mm -hmm. And that included making visits to the London School of Economics archives, mm -hmm. where I've, I've done a lot. But I also read his books in the 1930s, um, which, you know, besides the nature and significance, he wrote just uh, uh, about you know, just amazing books on international liberalism, planning, international liberalism, uh, trade cycle theory, a variety of things. He's a very practical economist, very easy reader. I mean, an easy person to read. He's a great writer. Um, and I became very, very impressed with Robbins um, as an intellect, uh, seeing him in these archives, the way he did things. And you had the chance to do that. But he saw this problem in the 30s of what he called odious uh, nationalism. Yes. Right. Rising up and that he was trying to offer the international liberalism as an alternative to that. And I was I was wondering if if you could talk a little bit about your opportunity to meet with Robbins and and, and similar to your what we talked about already with the great old masters from from Vienna period. But um, also then the various activities that took place in 1930, some of which were Robbins was involved in, uh, others of which other international liberals were involved in. So what I mean by that is like the effort in Geneva, mm -hmm. uh, the Lippmann Colloquium and, and these things. So maybe we could talk a little bit about those. Well, let me first put Robbins as a person in a certain intellectual context. Um, Friedrich Hayek once wrote an essay called Two Kinds of Minds. And he said there was the master and the muddler. The master is someone who knows, has read everything, remembers everything, and can articulate and express at the drop of a hat the, the arguments of any author and then to critically evaluate them with great insight. Uh, the muddler is the person who, who reads, but he sort of always has to go back and start all over again and reread, and he's never sure of how to put it all together. Now, in the article, uh, Hayek tried to compare von Bawerk and Wieser, the two leading 19th century Austrians, where von Bawerk was the master and Wieser was the muddler. But in conversation, Hayek told me that the real contrast that he had in mind was between Lionel Robbins and himself. Mm. That in his mind, Ma Robbins was the master. He had read everything in the history of economic thought and much else, obviously, uh, had an unbelievable ability of, of re mental retention of things in immense detail, and a drop of a hat could explain, argue, draw from, whereas I viewed himself as more as the muddler, sort of rethinking and going back. And uh, I personally don't think of Hayek as the muddler. Mm -hmm. I mean, he obviously had this um, immense intellectual capacity to remember, synthesize, and, and organize, and see creative strands in. But that's how he perceived Robbins. Now, um, 
in the early 80s, I was teaching for two years in Ireland and had the opportunity to frequently go over to London. And I knew someone who was studying at the London School of Economics at the time, taking Lionel Robbins, he was still at least teaching, in a sense, part-time, a history of economic thought class. And uh, I caught his lectures. I attended two of them. I caught his lectures on Thomas Malthus. And uh, at the end of each class, and I'm not exaggerating, the students stood up and gave him a standing ovation. Huh. His mastery of the material, his, his wit, uh, and his insightfulness in explaining it, uh, the humor with, with which he reads from Malthus and then rhetorically asks the students questions, well, how far of a Malthusian have we now become? Because who would be who would not accept these obvious assumptions uh, was amazing. And then I, I had a chance to talk with him in his office. Um, now his desk, with rather long legs, was on a platform, and then the guest was in a chair below the platform <laughs> on very short legs. So if you were talking to Lionel Robbins, you had to sort of crack your, crank your neck up and say. Yes, Lord Robbins. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, definitely looking up to the master. <laughs> right, yeah, yeah. Uh, but uh, we had this a long, we must have been together three hours. I mean, he was very generous with his time, talking about a lot of themes and nuances. And at one point I had asked him, and don't ask me what, something about in, in Bombavrik's capital theory. He proceeded to quote from Bombavrik in the original German. Yeah. And who knows how long earlier it had been that he'd even read it. Yeah. So that was the kind of mind that he had. Uh, now, Robbins had studied at the London School of Economics with Edwin Cannon. And Cannon, uh, though the LSE was actually founded by people associated with the Fabian Socialists, uh, Edwin Cannon was very much a, a, a classic liberal on most uh, uh, policy issues, certainly free trade, uh, the respect for the individual and international order. and. That, 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 that was the, the imprint on, on Robbins, this idea of the international man in the most complementary way, respectful of the diversity of cultures, contributions, uh, of, uh, of uh, tolerance uh, for, for the differences that, that give the world its common heritage. Uh, and so he, therefore, stood out as a figure, again, very influenced by the Austrians, uh, not only, but clearly very heavily by Mises. He had he had started traveling to Vienna in the 1920s. Uh, he, 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 had a, he could read German perfectly and had a sort of working speaking knowledge of German. Uh, and as a consequence of this, he, he became immersed in sort of the Austrian flavor of a cosmopolitanism, uh, the, the lingering aspects, if you will, of the Habsburg-Vienna atmosphere, which we talked about in an earlier uh, uh, discussion like this. Um, and in this context, he then saw himself uh, as, as a voice uh, at the London School of Economics for not just you know, the best in what he considered modern economics, which had a very large dose of Austrian contributions in his mind, although not exclusively. He was very much of an, uh, an ecumenical person attempting yeah. to bring together several strands of what he thought were good theories and many approaches. Uh, but particularly uh, a, a voice for, 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 the, for the liberal outlook on man and society and the market in an environment that is increasingly being straitjacketed through a rising tide of totalitarianism and ideologies of collectivism. Um, and that is the setting in which he writes uh, many of the works that he published in the 1930s. Uh, his book on uh, international order, which was actually originally a series of lectures that he gave at the Graduate Institute of International Studies in 1937, or his other little book published in 1939, The Economic Causes of War, which were also a series of lectures at the Graduate Institute in Geneva, uh, or th those sections where he's talking about uh, international aspects of the Great Depression in his book, The Great Depression, yeah. and a variety of, of, of other essays uh, on class conflict, a collection of essays on class, class conflict and other essays. Uh, all of this is his attempt uh, to to try to be a voice for for, for the, 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 the 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 humaneness of an open and free society in in in, in this rising clouds and, and storm of, of of dangerous and militaristic 
and totalitarian collectivism, which, which he, like many others, felt what was, was threatening. It did not mean that it was preordained, but was threatening uh, to bring about a twilight of liberalism in its broadest sense, if not opposed very yeah. forcefully. Yeah, one of my favorite, those, those are um, great books. One of my favorite ones from that time doesn't get published till 1952. It's his lectures on the theory of economic policy and the British classical political economy. And part of the reason why I like that so much, and I think that this is um, this is a kind of a weird thought experiment, but I, I think about it a lot of times, which is imagine that I could uh, go and, you know, Bill and Ted's excellent time machine mm -hmm. and go to different places to study economics right. at a particular time. Like, so I think in the, in the 1920s, um, it would be Vienna. Obviously, you know, in the in the, the Mises seminar, the mines there and everything like that. Um, but I do think in the 1930s, it would be the London School of Economics. I think the, the collection of people there. And if you fast forward enough, I mean, obviously I'm biased in this, but I tend to think if I was going to be in the late 1950s, early 1960s, I would have picked the Virginia with Buchanan and the Virginia School. But part of the reason why I like this book by um, uh, Robin so much is because he understood the infra institutional infrastructure that was required in order to have the economic order. And so part of that, uh, of that book is the claim that the liberal economic order and the liberal political and legal order evolve, co-evolve together. Yes. And that it's, it's very difficult to try to divorce the classical economists from the institutional environment, yes. whereas at that time in economics, people were trying to have an institutionally antiseptic economics. Mm -hmm. And that's one of the reasons why they go wrong is because they don't understand this infrastructure that's required. Mm -hmm. And he's laying that all out, which then, of course, becomes Buchanan's big thing. And so I really like that book. I understand my biases and in all of that. But it's it's fascinating because he does those lectures I think in thirty nine, but because of the war, then they're not published till fifty two. Right. Um, but I, I, I think and he's very fair in that book, if you recall. Yeah. Uh, it's very easy for someone who holds a particular view and looks at writers of the past to sort of only see or tend to highlight those ideas in the past authors to sort of reinforce his own current views. He doesn't do that. Yeah. He talks about, you know, what, what, what did the classical economists think was the role of an open and competitive and free economy? And what did they consider essential roles of government, okay. which many classical liberals today would, would sort of put questions on mark. Do sure. we really need government to do X, Y, okay. and Z? Are there not market solutions to those social problems as well? Yeah. But he just lets the cards fall as they may to just explain to the reader what their total world view was on a variety of the roles that government shouldn't be in and the roles that he yeah. thought gov they thought the government should be. Yeah, no, it's a I very fair and balanced analysis. Yeah, I think it's a, actually great. You mentioned that uh, you know his economic plan, the international order, was a set of lectures at Geneva. Yes. Uh, Mises moves to Geneva in 1934, is that right? Yes, they, autumn of 34. Yeah, can you tell us a little bit about the Graduate Institute in Geneva and its role in... Uh, economic science policy and and uh, sort of defending liberalism at yes. this time. Yes, it, it, it had uh, co-founders, two uh, two uh, economists. One was the famous French economic historian Paul Mantou, and the other was with an economist and political scientist William E. Rapard. Uh, I particularly I've even written an article on sort of an intellectual short intellectual biography of Rapard. Um, and uh, he, he, was a, he had Swiss parents, but he was born in the United States because of business his father was on. He actually graduated from Harvard University, but spent uh, a year in Vienna studying with uh, Bombavark and Wieser, uh, and then uh, taught at Harvard for a while, but then returned to Geneva and became a professor at the University of, Virginia, of Geneva. He was with the, uh, uh, the, the, the Swiss observer delegation uh, to the Treaty of Versailles to talk about a future League of Nations. Now, I don't know if it's apocryphal or not, but several biographers say that he left such an impression on Woodrow Wilson that Wilson agreed to the idea that the League of Nations headquarters would be in Geneva. Mm. Uh, then fast forward a few years later, uh, in 1927, uh, 
with funding assistance from the Rockefeller Foundation, though other sources, uh, he and Mantu found the Graduate Institute of International Studies. And as he saw it, is that uh, in this post-war era, it would be desirable to bring together a unique set of faculty members uh, who would have an international outlook from a variety of perspectives and who could then be, could have a calm, tranquil environment for their own research, but also uh, be there to e educate uh, a group of selected and, and chosen students from an international uh, background of, of selection um, to, to preserve this and share their ideas with another generation. And that became the focus. Now, uh, if, if you'll permit me, th there's several interesting dimensions to this that I'd like to talk about. Mm -hmm. One of this was, is that the faculty was very international. There were Americans, uh, a fellow named Potter who taught uh, law. Uh, there was, a, for a time, Jacob Viner from the University of Chicago was a visiting professor there. He's fact, offered a job there, actually. Yeah, he right? was hel yeah. holding the chair that Mises ended up holding. The reason he, he left Geneva and didn't stay there was the University of Chicago told him he either returns to Chicago or he loses tenure. Yeah. And he chose Chicago with tenure as opposed to staying in Geneva permanently. Um, and with the, with the rising tide of fascism and Nazism, especially, uh, Rappard now makes this an intellectual and academic refuge for scholars escaping from surrounding tyranny. The, the first one who is invited and is allowed to come there uh, is Guillermo Ferraro. He's, he's forgotten today. But in the first half of the 20th century, he was one of the most recognized and internationally respected European historians. He wrote a five-volume history of, 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 uh, of the, uh, on, on, on uh, the, the greatness and decline of Rome, that is, the Roman Empire. That was highly acclaimed. Uh, he was a classical liberal against war. In 1900, he wrote a book uh, called Militarism on the, on the spirit of, of, a, of a free and non-militaristic society. Uh, he did, wrote books contrasting the old world with the new because he traveled in the United States. Um, and he basically, with the rise of Mussolini, was, was not allowed to teach or publicly lecture. He was basically under intellectual, not saying police, but intellectual house arrest, if you follow what I'm saying. Uh, he continued to write books. He has one called Four Years Under Fascism, then another book in 1924-25 called Words to the Deaf, uh, in which he's talking about to a world that's not listening, the dangers of this oppressive regimes that the world that mankind is facing. But finally, he, he was allowed to leave uh, for Mussol by Mussolini's government for Geneva. So from 1930 until he dies in 1942, uh, he becomes a professor of history at the Graduate Institute. And during this time, he writes a series of lectures. Uh, one, is this, one is called Peace and War. Mm -hmm. uh, another one is called The Gamble, which is about Napoleon. Then he has another one called The Reconstruction of Europe, about the peace treaties after Napoleon's defeat. And how those peace treaties, by not being vengeful treaties, by attempting to respect all nations and not be uh, peace treaties of, of, of territorial acquisition, uh, set the stage for a century of, at least in Europe, peace, 1815 mm. to 1914. He's basically talking about what, we, what are the ingredients of, of a liberal basis of international peace after a devastating war. And then the final one, which actually came out of the year um, that he died, 1942, is called uh, The Principle of Power. And what is it that, that government power represents, and, and why does it have its attraction, and what are its dangers? And then I might say, just because I happen to like the guy a lot, uh, long after his death, um, his lectures on the French Revolution were published. It's called the, the, the Two French Revolutions, which were among his lectures at the Geneva Institute in his courses. It's a fascinating account of the first French Revolution, which is grounded in liberty, and the second French Revolution that becomes the terror. Mm. Uh, so he's the first person there. Uh, that is soon followed in 1934 by Ludwig von Mises uh, and uh, someone who had been Mises' uh, classmate at the uh, uh, academic uh, gymnasium in Vienna, Hans Kelsen, the famous uh, philosopher of yeah. law, uh, a 
an, uh, the developer of a version of legal positivism, but also the person who primarily wrote the new constitution of the Republic of Austria after the First World War. Yeah. Uh, both of them went at the same time uh, and both left in 1940, respectively coming to the United States. Then in 1937, there were two more editions of an international flavor. Uh, Michael Heilprin, who was a Polish economist, uh, who, who came on board and basically stayed there except for a few years in the United States uh, until he died in the 1960s. And then significantly, uh, the German free market economist Wilhelm Röpke. Now, uh, again, if I may I'll be allowed a few words about people I admire. Mm -hmm. uh, Röpke was born in 1899. He died in 1966. Uh, he was, he fought in the First World War uh, and came back disillusioned and confused and came across a few books that were deeply influential on him. One of which was Mises' 1919 book, Nation, State, and Economy. That is, he said, put everything into perspective. Uh, he uh, earned his own degree and then became the youngest professor of what we call today economics in the Germany of the 1920s at the University of Marburg. Now it's 1933, and in January 30th, 1933, uh, Hitler becomes chancellor of Germany. And there are a lot, most, most academics in Germany either were enthusiastic Nazis, and there was a large segment. If you think them as street thug brutes, it's amazing if you do like a who's who of Nazi Germany, how many Nazi officials, party members, even Holocaust organizers and participants uh, had law degrees, economics degrees, science degrees, philosophy degrees. It's horrifying how much of the German intellectual community actively loved National Socialism. But most of them were the type, you know, you go along to get along. Wilhelm Repke refused to. Within a couple of weeks after Hitler rising to the chancellorship, he's giving public addresses saying that Germany is entering an era of barbarism where, where the brute has replaced reason and emotion has replaced logic and that Germany is leaving the civilized community of nations and when it does so, it deserves no respect. And the German people better understand what they are doing. Well, the upshot of it was he had a visit from two, two uh, brown shirt thugs who basically told him that he better get with the new order or. And he had a wife and twin daughters. And uh, as anyone would, of course, he was concerned about his own safety. And he left. And he basically ended up teaching at the University of Istanbul in Turkey. And he did that from uh, 19, late 1933, early 1934, till 1937, uh, when he was offered a position at the Graduate Institute of International Studies. And he remained there until his death in 1966. Uh, three times he was offered the opportunity to come to the US uh, with offers of academic positions during World War II. All three times he turned it down, saying that even though he couldn't be sure whether Germany might invade Switzerland, it was always possible, uh, his responsibility was to remain a voice of reason and sound economics hmm. for a world that will have to recover uh, from all that, that, as he called it, brown totalitarianism, as opposed to red totalitarianism, mm -hmm. uh, what was doing on the continent. And his books were smuggled into Nazi Germany and were read clandestinely by non-Nazi or anti-Nazi German economists, many of whom became the fathers of what we, we now call the German miracle in the post-war period. Uh, Ludwig Erhard, uh, Walter Eucken, and a variety of others. Um, so he, he, was a, he, was a, he was a leading voice. And all of these voices were viewed as offering uh, an oasis. And that's a phrase that, 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 um, that Robbins uses in his preface to that 1939 book, The Causes of War, uh, a tranquil oasis in, in, in an ocean of, of rising tyranny uh, that, that has left its mark already uh, on, on, on sound thinking. And, uh, and its place, therefore, in, in trying to preserve the liberal heritage uh, is, is immensely important. Um, that was its purpose. That was its goal. And what would happen, and I know I don't mean to talk too much about this, that's the product when you know too much about something. Um, from 1927 until 1939, 
uh, William Rappard had annual series of le guest lectures that were published as Problems of Peace with, again, an international circle of, of, of writers. Uh, and then on top of that, he would have single professors in the spring, because the annual lectures usually were in the summer. That became these Problems of Peace volumes. But during the spring, you would have single visitors. So, um, so, so, so you have uh, uh, people such as Louis Roger, the famous French liberal, uh, coming there. And he, he, he delivered lectures that became two excellent books on modern political mystiques and modern economic mystiques. Uh, unfortunately, those are only in, in French. I've had the opportunity to read them in an unpublished translations. They're brilliant. Then there's Hayek's, uh, what is it, Monetary uh, Order and International Stability? Mm -hmm. I, monetary, monetary Nationalism. nationalism. Yeah. That was lectures at, at, the, at the Graduate Institute. Uh, uh, I'm blanking out, but, but there are a whole variety of visiting who then publish their works uh, from across the continent, offering visions of a sound economics, a liberal free society, and the importance of, of international cooperation rightly understood. And, and that was the role that the Geneva Institute, it was, it was a shining beacon of the best of what liberalism meant in the 19th century in a century that was moving in the opposite direction. So you mentioned uh, Louis uh, Rougier. Yes. Um, it's my understanding, right, that he was the person who organized the colloquium Walter Lippmann. Yes. Um, and so that actually is 1938, is that right? Yes. Or 37? Uh, 38, I think, and, and Mises and Hayek are at that and, and several other uh, leading liberals. And, and uh, it's often viewed as a, a watershed of, uh, you know, uh, liberal thinking and international cooperation that then gets cut short yes. because of the war, the yes. outbreak of war. But perhaps maybe you could talk a little bit about that and their effort to try to um, address liberalism at that time. Right. Now, uh, in uh, a year uh, early, Excuse me. Let, uh, one thing I wanted to ask you about, that if you could address too in this, is that um, a liberal free trade, like Mises, for example, taught trade, I think, uh, yeah. when he was there. And Halpern... International economic relations. Right. And Halpern himself was an international trade uh, expert. expert, right? Yes. And so liberal free trade is a very much a big part of their doctrine about international liberalism. Yes. And um, that also uh, obviously becomes an issue in prior to the war and then after the war trying to reconstruct right. the liberal order. So maybe you could talk about why free trade is such an, uh, a critical part of liberalism. Right. Well, first of all, obviously, uh, as economists, they understand the importance of division of labor and comparative advantage. Uh, all of humanity will materially be better off uh, if men specialize their tasks in the service of each other through market exchange, through the Smithian invisible hand that knows no boundaries. Uh, economic uh, specialization and division of labor is global. And if we ever find uh, people uh, on other planets it would be just as reasonable for there to be intergalactic division of labor and comparative advantage. Uh, but while that involved, in a sense, the, the material aspect of all people improving their circumstances through the specializations of their global neighbors, there was also the idea that, that the more that, that men traded with each other, the more they, they other things developed. One, tolerance and respect. The stranger was no longer so strange. There was also the international trade and exchange of ideas, music, literature, science, culture, which did not mean that there was going to be one homogeneous global culture or science or, or community, yeah. but, but that there would be a sharing, uh, an intermingling, a respect, and each benefiting from, from what the other had. And then finally, of course, there was the crucial element that supposedly it seems to be apocryphal line in Frederick Bastiat. If, 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 if trade doesn't cross borders, armies will. Um, and the idea was that, that international trade, um, by integrating and, and connecting nations, uh, makes each, each people so more mutually interdependent. You're my customer. You're my supplier. Uh, that that it, will, it will not prevent war, but it raises the costs that people might think twice before they rush into war and destroy their connections with each other, and not only bring about the disaster of the conflict itself, 
but the immiseration that comes from the loss of international economic integration. Um, all right, so let's that that's a great summary. I, I you've uh, I think you're the source of pointing out to me. Uh, Mises has this, uh, and I think you reprinted in one of your volumes, maybe Method, Process, and that volume on money that you did with Kluwer many right, years yes, ago, yes, yes. where you have the disintegration of the International Division of Labor. Did yes. you reprint that piece in there? Yes. No, yeah. Well, yeah. In 1938, the Graduate Institute in Geneva published a volume uh, marking their 10th anniversary. It's called The World Crisis, and it's made up of essays by the faculty. Yeah. Uh, and so what you have there is, among others, Mises' essay on the, uh, the international disintegration of the division of labor, in which he explains what is happening, why it's happening, and the disastrous consequences following yeah. from it. Yeah, it's a brilliant piece. Yes. Yeah. Um, okay, so the Walter Lippmann collo colloquium, you know, the Good Society is published, they organize it. Uh, what's your understanding of what they were trying to do? And and where they went from there. Yeah, uh, Walter Lippmann had published this volume called An Inquiry into the Nature and uh, Significance or Something of the Good Society, just called for short The Good Society in 1937. It was uh, primarily, though not only, the result of a series of lengthy articles he had written over a couple of years for the Atlantic Monthly, as I best understand. Um, and this book is a sensation. It begets wide attention. Um, there are two parts to the book. The first part is a critical analysis of explaining what is the condition of the world and attempting to understand why. And here is basically a classical liberal analysis and critique of the rising threats of collectivism, both totalitarian collectivism and what he calls piecemeal, piecemeal um, uh, gradual collectivism, where it isn't an overthrow of the entire system overnight, but government growth over economic and social affairs here and then there and there. And then, like, you know, if you stare at a clock, you don't see the hands move. Mm -hmm. But if you look at it and then turn away after a while, you turn and look and, oh, 20 minutes has gone by. How, how did that happen? Mm -hmm. So these piecemeal increases in, in government intervention, regulation, control may not seem great in themselves, but cumulatively, you're moving toward a fully collectivized society. And in this part of the book, he draws upon uh, among others, very, very uh, clearly in the footnotes, uh, Mises and Hayek's critique of socialist central planning. Uh, and then the second part of the book is his idea of liberal, the, a reconstruction of liberalism. Uh, how, shall we, how shall we make the case for a new liberalism uh, that, that can act as a bolster and a sounder basis for a, a non-collectivist world? One of the people deeply impressed by this was this French economist and social philosopher, Louis Roger. And he organized this international conference uh, in Paris in August of 1938. They met for about four days, um, bringing together some of the leading uh, voices and figures uh, in France, in Britain, uh, from uh, uh, Switzerland and, and uh, I think Sweden and as well, uh, Spain, to discuss these matters. Uh, if I can add a sort of a curiosum footnote, at the beginning of the volume, there's a page of who the attendees were. Uh, Friedrich Hayek, Great Britain. So-and-so, um, uh, -so, uh, uh, Holland. You know. So then on the list is Wilhelm Röpke and Ludwig von Mises. There's, respectively, say, the Austrian school. It does, if you look at it. I'll have to look at that. Yeah. Röpke does not want to be associated with the Nazi Germany that is no longer the country representing the land of his birth. And Mises wants to have nothing to do with the Nazi Germany that has annexed his homeland, to which he had a strong a patriotic attachment. Yeah. So they're not Brits. They're not Frenchmen. They're not Swedes. They're not Dutch. They're certainly not Germans. They're members of the nation known as the Austrian <laughs> school. Cool. Yeah. But, uh, but um, so, so these, these, these thinkers and scholars came together. And uh, it was the proceedings that were published in French, uh, and hardly any volumes. When I f when when I got when I wanted to read through the volume, uh, I had the, the, and I was at that time at Hillsdale College, uh, and the librarian arranged you know interlibrary loan. I had to search far and wide. There was like only three or four copies in the entire United States, yeah. uh, and I think the copy that 
they were able to arrange, you know, a, a lens from this maybe one of the universities in the Boston area. Um, and uh, the, the proceedings basically are broken down to the sessions of it. And uh, I'm not going to remember all the subheadings, but it's sort of uh, what is liberalism and, 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 and why has it been challenged? The cultural challenges to liberalism, the political ones, the international aspects of it, the dangers of war. Um, and so you have these people going back and forth, all with the spirit of believing in the, the essentiality of the, the respect and freedom of the individual, the need for a political order that, that is based upon rule of law and uh, an impartiality of the rights of the citizenry, and fundamentally all believing in the, the institutions of a market economy, private property, open, free competition, uh, the, the, the workings of the profit and loss system as the incentives for both right directing of production and, and, and creativity improvement over time. Uh, but then the arguments and disputes as to what is, what, how did li liberalism fail? Mm -hmm. In other words, well, how, it, it must have failed because you have this totalitarianism. Uh, what are its, does it have a future given the dangers it's facing? And, and what cases and arguments and institutional changes would have to be made uh, to restore it after, this, after these totalitarian dangers have hopefully passed from the scene when they all sense, and they're all, it's clear from this, it's not that they're saying if war occurs. It's 1938, it's August of 1938. Hitler has remilitized the Rhineland. He has annexed uh, uh, Austria. And August of 1938, that's a month before the Munich conference, yeah. where Britain and France hand him the Sudetenland of, of neighboring Czechoslovakia. So Hitler's ranting and raving about that now in August of 1938. So it isn't about whether war will come. They're all concerned, well, war is going to come. The date is uncertain. Yeah. And what is that going to mean also for the future of liberalism? And then a, a post-war, hopefully better liberal world. Uh, and what you find are conflicts and differences. There are heated arguments. Uh, Mises, it, not too surprisingly for any of the listeners who are familiar with his uh, uh, rather strong uh, position on, on many issues of laissez on, for laissez-faire, is challenged, particularly uh, by uh, the German uh, Alexander Rustov, who is a close friend and collaborator of, of Wilhelm Repke's. Uh, they, they battle tooth and nail about the visions of why liberalism has failed and what a new liberal society would have to have. Um, now, of course, those are just a few episodes. There's a lot of debates mm -hmm. and discussion by many, uh, but that comes out clearly. And then, of course, at the end, they have to ask, well, what are we going to call this new thing after the war? Is it going to be called neoliberalism, social liberalism, uh, 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 market liberalism? And uh, so finally, they come down. Uh, social liberalism sounds too socialist. Uh, new liberalism, they basically end up what well, not a vote acceptance, but sort of a consensus of neoliberalism. And neoliberalism will have to have the best of the old world, but not laissez-faire. Mm -hmm. uh, Lipman had argued for uh, moderate degrees of government regulation, um, moderating inequality of income in the society, uh, an enlightened role of government in various ways that the 19th century liberals in general would have, would, would have not accepted. Uh, and that becomes a consensus. But this was meant to be the basis of, of, of future meetings uh, in 1939 and, and 1940. But of course, because of the Munich Conference crisis, yeah. and then in March of 1939, Hitler annexing the rest of Czechoslovakia, and then the clouds in of, of, of clearly a, a full-blown war coming, which comes in September of 39 with the German invasion of, of Poland from the West, and then two weeks later by the Soviet Union under Stalin's orders from the East, because of their secret pact. Yeah. Um, that 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 hope for project of an of an associ of a society uh, to help bring about a, a revival of, of a liberal order uh, disappears because of the war. Yeah. Of course, that's part of the inspiration after the war for Hayek to uh, constitute the creation of the Montpellier Society. Yeah. I, I want to. So that is the normal way in which people would then take this. I I want to. Um, sort of take the conversation in a slightly different way, which is uh, to follow Mises and his move to the United States. 
and the founding of a lot of the institutions which we talked about earlier, which you um, participated in. Um, Foundation for Economic Education and Leonard Reed, which you eventually became president of. Uh, the Institute for Humane Studies, which is an offshoot of FEE that Baldy Harper started, which you were a, a student participant of. Um, just to, uh, and Mises' role in both of those organizations. Right. Just as a, a little background to then returning back to your book and a discussion about how you see liberalism today. So. Yeah, it, it's, always, it's hard sometimes to put yourself in the shoes of those who are living in a, in a historical epoch and how they saw it both subjectively and what the objective circumstances were. Yeah. Um, the, the attitude of many uh, concerning the post-war period was that this was an era that was going to have a far greater degree of government regulation and planning. You, we couldn't return to the old war world. First of all, there was a great fear that the world would sink back into a Great Depression. So we're going to have to have an activist a governmental set of monetary and fiscal policies under the, the now enlightened uh, and advanced view of Keynes and the general theory. Um, th then you had out-and-out out, uh, 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 advocates of planning. Now, some of the listeners may know a famous uh, mathematician named Lawrence Klein, who won the Nobel Prize. But around, uh, I might get the date wrong, 1947 or 48. He wrote a popularized version called The Keynesian Revolution. It's very well written, and it, it really explains most of Keynesian economics uh, in, in a very, you know, the informed layman's setting to understand. But he has, at the end of the chapter, saying that there's a new freedom that we need, and that is freedom from unemployment, yeah. uh, fr freedom from want, uh, freedom from the uncertainties of life, and we shouldn't be afraid of government planning. He calls for a scrapping of the Constitution in de facto. Uh, we can't wait for Congress to deliberate about budgetary matters. There has to be a central committee that has the taxing and spending authority to do Keynesian stuff. You fall into recession, deficits. The economy's recovering, surpluses. You have to raise taxes, low cost. They would have the arbitrary power to do this. And he says, this is just a new freedom and a new security that, that, that people shouldn't be afraid of because a more important freedom will be given to them. Uh, that, 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 then there was a fellow at the University of Chicago named Marion. I'm forgetting his first name. But he was a socialist. And he has an essay. in, in Charles? Yes. And he has this book. He has an essay in a book called uh, Saving Capitalism, uh, an anthology. And I'm, God, age is catching I'm blanking who the editor is. But it's someone that you and I, if you hear his name, you know who exactly it is immediately. It's one of those guys who constantly was anthologizing volumes at that time. But Mariam says, planning is coming, and there's no way to prevent it. Yeah. There's only one decision. Shall it be totalitarian planning or democratic planning? That's your only choice. Th this was the mindset. Um, so, in, and, so in this setting, those voices who still had a concern for liberty in Europe and uh, in the United States uh, decided that things had to be done. And uh, so Leonard Reed, that would be a separate story, uh, ended up founding uh, the Foundation for Economic Education in 1946. He brought together uh, academics and scholars and journalists like uh, uh, Henry Hazlitt, uh, a variety of respected businessmen who could uh, be generous, to set up the foundation uh, to, to maintain knowledge and to educate people in, the, in these freedom ideas. He soon brought uh, uh, important uh, 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 market economists onto staff with Orville Watts, uh, Floyd Baldy Harper. He started, uh, he was introduced to Ludwig von Mises by Henry Hazlitt, because Henry Hazlitt was on the original uh, board of trustees. And Mises was brought on at, in an advisory role uh, to, to, to both offer advice as well as to lecture. Um, I, I, I ha, uh, when I was fee president, uh, Bettina Graves shared with me the manuscripts that she had meticulously taken, you know, transcribing two lecture series that Mises gave under the auspices of fee in the 1950s. Um, and I, I had them transcribed, and she went over and made sure it was correct. And one is called uh, uh, 
free market and its enemies, and the other is called Marxism Unmasked. Yeah. And, and this was Mises, uh, under the auspices of Fee, uh, giving really high-level lectures for the informed you know, non-academic audience yeah. on the nature of, of, of all these political economic issues. Uh, and that's what, they, that, that, that's what Fee's job was. Now, I should also mention that th there were businesses that were concerned with these matters. Um, I mentioned that, that Michael Halpern, who was teaching at the Graduate Institute, has spent a few years in the United States during and immediately after the war. Well, Michael Halpern was hired by Procter & Gamble, right? The corporation you know, makes soap and other things. He was writing pamphlets for them, mm -hmm. criticizing the Full Employment Act of yeah. 1946, yeah, yeah. Which, which, which I found copies of. Uh, and so, so, so these were sort of uh, what later became known as the intellectual remnant, the keepers of the freedom flame. flame. Um, those who were influenced and inspired by uh, Hayek's The Road to Serfdom, or uh, Mises's two wartime books in the United States, Omnitive and Government and Bureaucracy, um, the novels by three classical liberal female uh, uh, authors, Rose Wilder Lane with The Rediscovery of Freedom, uh, Isabel Patterson, The God of the Machine, and of course Ayn Rand in her novel form, The Fountainhead, uh, and, and earlier in the 30s, We the Living in Anthem. Uh, the, the, these were the, the, these were lone voices uh, to have an effect, yeah. uh, and they were preserving a, 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 an intellectual heritage and, and a notion of an institutional order of liberty that, that seemed to be under under the threat of extinction, not just in Europe, but but even in this piecemeal basis in the United States. It was sad and and and, and concerned times for anyone who cared about liberty. And um, and so then the story. Um, takes place between 1950 and 1980 about the slow advance of these ideas you mentioned earlier about the power of Milton Friedman in the yes. post-war era and the, the role that Mises and obviously the road to serfdom by Hayek played in developing this remnant. Um, the Institute for Humane Studies is then started. Um, but that brings us to like liberalism today. So we've had a, a, a fair amount. We've had an Austrian revival, which you were a major part of, of pulling off um, and uh, or participating and then helping, you know, pull off at the end. Um, but uh, we're in a world today which seems to be, again, a rising tide of certain forms of populism and, and, uh, and nationalism, uh, attacks on free trade and globalization. And so a new case for liberalism once again arises. Uh, fortunately, we don't yet have on our doorsteps, you know, the barbarians of Nazism or the of collectivist totalitarianism of of the socialist uh, Soviet type. Um, but we do have other threats uh, yes. that we face. And you have this new book out and you're trying to do that. So let's end with a conversation a little bit about liberalism, the power that you see of liberalism, the promise that you see of liberalism for the, the world that we have today and for you're a grandparent, and you're so your grandchildren. Yeah. Your own version of Keynes's economic consequences uh, for your grandchildren, or whatever. Right. Yeah. Well, l l let me say that um, I became early on discovering all of these classic liberal or libertarian or free market or whatever way you want to put a label on these ideas, and and they 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 resonated with me very strongly from an early teenager time. Uh, the freedom of the individual the dignity of the person, the right of freedom of choice, uh, the, 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 the reasonableness of, of voluntary consent and freedom of association, the dangers, crudeness, and, and brutalism of, of force applied unnecessarily. And by unnecessarily, I mean in non-defensive ways. Uh, and so for all of my life since I discovered these ideas, uh, I've attempted to become informed and knowledgeable about them and to teach them in various uh, ways as a professor and, and to the best of my ability in my writings um, to sort of help keep them alive and to advance the case and, and, and win the argument. Uh, I've written a number of books, uh, but this latest one called For a New Liberalism is meant to sort of very ar to articulate this case. In the, in the beginning of the book, I try to re explain to people what liberalism traditionally was and the great crusades that 
that liberalism fought in the 19th century and achieved for mankind. Yeah. And if I may, I'm just going to very quickly enumerate them. The liberal crusade against slavery. Slavery was in, is an institution as old as all of recorded human history. It has nothing to do with race. The ancient Greeks enslaved each other in their wars among the city-states. The Romans move out from the city-state of Rome to conquer first the peninsula of Italy and then Europe and then good parts of the Middle East and a, a chunk of northern Africa. And they're equal opportunity in slavery. They don't care what you look like or what your religion or ethnicity is. You know, you lose. We haven't killed you. Guess what? You're our, you're our slave. The Chinese did that. The, the Koreans and the Japanese did Everybody, the caste system in India was based upon conquest. Um, so, so as a consequence, slavery is the oldest institution. There were people who, who philosophized, uh, had religious uh, in, beliefs of, you know, a world in which all men were free and, and none were oppressed. But that was like a pipe dream. Mm -hmm. And then suddenly, in, in the middle of, of the, of the uh, 18th century, the 1700s, with, with, with these emerging liberal ideas, uh, symbolized, he's not the only voice, but he's so well known, symbolized by, by John Locke, even with his own personal inconsistencies. Now this leads to the formation of an anti-slavery league in Great Britain uh, that triumphs in 19, 1833 with an act of parliament that ends slavery at the beginning in the entire British Empire at the beginning of 19, 1834. Uh, this, this leads to, to a snowball movement that by the end of the 19th century, there is no formal legal system of slavery virtually anywhere. The other, the second crusade, uh, equality before the law. Uh, up until the 1830s, I think it was, or 1840s, uh, a Jew could not give testimony in a British course of law because he wouldn't put his hands on the Christian Bible. Uh, uh, up until the, the 1830s, a Jew in Austria who wanted to live in Vienna had to get permission to reside there from the emperor. You had to pay money to have children if you were a Jew, because the population, you didn't want to have too many Jews unless they paid to have kids. Mm -hmm. I mean, th this sounds bizarre today. It, as, as late as those decades of the 19th century, the liberals of the early 19th century said the law should be equal and unbiased and treating all the same, both in their rights and, in their, and, and what is expected them, such as a trial by jury, testimony, voting. That was a triumph. It, it was a given to everyone at the same time, but that was the momentum that mm -hmm. by the late 19th and early 20th century, all these discriminatory abuses against ethnic or religious or gender minority, minorities are, are, are gone. Uh, the, th the Third Crusade. Uh, the Third Crusade is for economic liberty. The, the abolition of the mercantilist system beginning in Great Britain with the Anti-Corn Laws uh, League that, that uh, in, in, in June of 1846, through a, a, an act of parliament, uh, basically unilaterally established free trade throughout the British Empire. Uh, and then, then uh, uh, the, the, the other major one uh, that I would mention is, is, is the crusade for international peace. Now, Europeans did not treat people in other parts of the world very nice. But it doesn't change the fact that, however imperfectly and contradictorily they practice their own principles, those principles of liberalism resulted in the idea of arbitration among nations as opposed to war. Uh, the emerging Geneva and Hague rules on the treatment of prisoners of war as well as uh, innocent combatants who are living under territories you've occupied. You may respect their life and property and only tax them to cover the expenses of your occupation of their territory during the war. These were the liberal accomplishments of the 19th century. Peace, dignity, rights, nonviolence, equality, justice, openness to economic opportunity. The world had never seen this. This should be the most, however, we're dealing with imperfect people who are imperfect in an imperfect world. We should be viewing this as the greatest century in humankind up to that point. And that was reversed by two counter-revolutions in the second half of the 19th century, socialism and nationalism. Socialism either cloaking itself in a, under, 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 under the cover of democracy, social democracy or not, 
And nationalism, the state must have power. The state must plan. The state must control. The individual is to be subservient to a higher good, the people as a whole or the nation. The individual passes away, but the nation goes on. And therefore, you're a droplet in the stream of your nation. Uh, and, and while these ideas are building up uh, in, in, in the late 19th century, the First World War re re results to, to, to their release. We don't have a war to end all wars, as, 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 as Wilson and others spoke about. The demons are released. The Soviet Revolution, fascism in Italy, a decade later, Nazism, the growing authoritarianism throughout the European continent. By 1937, there are no democratic regimes in the eastern part of Europe except Czechoslovakia. Mm -hmm. You're either totalitarian or authoritarian. The, the clouds of tyranny are falling upon the world. And in spite of, of, of the success in defeating Nazism and fascism, and even with the final end of the Soviet Union with, with, uh, in, in the early 1990s, and therefore the end of the Cold War in that sense, and, and nothing as, as abhorrent in the Western nations as what was experienced under either the Soviets or the Nazis. The fact is that there has been this creeping growth of government uh, in my lifetime, how much the government controls, how much the government intrudes, how much the government regulates, how much the government prohibits, how much the government taxes, how much the government sets up procedures to determine human social forms of interaction for or against required or, or forbidden. Uh, we are we are we are a planned society in a velvet glove to a great extent, in my humble opinion, and I believe that this is accelerated with this emergence of the call for for uh, democratic socialism, a green new deal, uh, the, the nationalist populism that you see in Europe, uh, Vladimir Putin in Russia, or Orban in in Hungary, uh, various strains of this in in Poland. Anyone who follows international politics would go on with et cetera, et cetera, yeah, yeah. et cetera. Uh, the rise of China, w w w which is 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 in a, a communist regime that basically runs as a, its society increasingly as a form of economic fascism. They're allowing economic liberty uh, for private property and private initiative, but within the card of what the government wants, and it will shut it down at any moment and redirect it under under control if necessary. Uh, so at this point. You know, however lonely and small and insignificant my little voice may be, uh, I, I, I published this book. So in the first part of the book, I explained the heritage and achievements of, of liberalism in the way I've espoused for too long of a period of time. I apologize. I try to explain what made America different through part of its history, even with all its warts and pimples. Uh, in a chapter that says, uh, it is free, why do immigrants have come to America? They wanted freedom, or what has that meant? Uh, I then uh, do a series of chapters on what does what does it mean to have a liberal market order, and I restate the case for competition, entrepreneurship, the private property order, and and explain uh, why there are false models of these and wrong-headed policies, mm -hmm. a misunderstanding of competition in the textbook sense, yeah. uh, misunderstandings of monopoly, its its meanings and and and, and policy implications. I discuss externalities and property rights. I respond to issues about uh, the something about asymmetric information problems, which I try to show in an open competitive mar uh, uh, market either do not exist or are highly minimized. Uh, I just I ask the question: Do we really need government to do these things that most of us take for common sense? The government should do uh, in infrastructure and supposedly public goods. And then I com complete the book w with reminding people of the importance of, of tolerance and openness, um, and, and that to be a liberal is not only to advocate non-violence in society, but one has to have a, a psychology and, 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 a, and an attitude of liberalism. Uh, even in the voluntary and non-regulated society, the liberal should speak out against intolerance. The liberal should speak out in, against bigotry, bigotry, not by the use of force to make people act in the right, reason, persuasion, example. H how did there occur the emergence of an anti-slavery league in, in the 18th century? It wasn't passed by law. People often guided by their religious faith, it was heavily guided by people, devout Christians in this case, who reasoned with their fellow men. Is it right for, right for one man to hold another in bondage when we are all the same and equal children of one Lord in heaven? 
and you persuade enough people, and that changes people's attitudes and behavior, and then law follows opinion, as David Hume often talked about. And, and then I, I conclude with a chapter on the, 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 the lessons of liberty and, and, and not to lose confidence, because it can be one, and I explain how. Yeah, that sounds uh, fantastic, uh, Richard, and uh, I hope that uh, you get a wide readership of that. Well, thank you. Uh, thank you very much uh, for these conversations. I, uh, they'll, uh, they're illuminating and, and, and insightful, so thank you very much. My pleasure, and thank you. Thank you for listening to the Hayek Program podcast. To learn more about the research, scholars, and work of the Hayek Program, visit hayek.mercatus.org. For more information about graduate student fellowship opportunities for students at Mason as well as at universities across the globe, please visit students.mercatus.org. We hope you recommend students to our programs or consider applying yourself.